of our King. Our Gospel this evening is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So far, text. Dear Christian friends, what is in a name? Do you know that one of the most common names about 100 years ago was the name Adolf? It's a good name. Starts with the letter A, you know, alliteration. If you want your kid to be at the front of the class, naturally it would happen. And yet that guy kind of ruined the name Adolf forever. Only if you hate your child would you name him Adolf. Maybe it'll come back as memory forgets, but I don't know. I think Adolf might be doomed. It's interesting. When you look at the most popular baby names of 2017, anybody want to guess? Jackson and Sophia. Those were the two most named names of babies in 2017. Names kind of ebb and flow. Years ago, you used to have meaning or a historical name. My name is Frederick because my great, great, great something or other was named Frederick. I always liked Frederick the Wise, one of the electors from the Reformation, of course. I thought that was a fitting name for myself. My brothers didn't agree. What is it a name? And so you go back into the Bible and you see all kinds of names. And are some names in the Bible better than others? Like, do people name their child Esau? Probably more like Jacob, right? Well, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You see those all over the place. And yet one of the names that we don't use is Judas. Right? Is he the most despised name of all? The one who betrayed our God? I wonder. When you look at this parable, um, you see Jesus talking to a crowd that was confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. And I'm always careful when I walk into my flock to not necessarily assume. Usually I try to ask questions of you. Because I don't know your life. I know you a little bit. Some of you better than others. But I'm not going to say, you filthy. You rot. That's not necessarily fair. Because I don't know where you're the weakest. I know that all of you struggle with sin. That's much I'm going to assume but I don't know where that weakness might be. So I ask questions, what do you like? And so Jesus doesn't really do that either. He doesn't just accuse them. Certain places he does, but he kind of draws them into a story, and he tries to get them to see themselves as either the Pharisee or the tax collector. And I don't think anybody wants to see themselves as a tax collector. Now that doesn't really work today for us, because IRS agents are... Well, that's a noble task, accounting, and yeah, it's pretty benign with numbers, and works on percentages. Back in Jesus' day, it was graft. It was extortion. It was physical force. People were hauled off into slavery if they didn't pay their tax. Being in debt was a big deal. You could lose your children. So being a tax collector was not exactly something you were the worst of the worst. In fact, you were a sellout because you weren't part of the Jewish nation. You worked for Rome. And so I always struggled to see what would be, I mean, what are you, 
drug dealer. I heard more about MS-13, this satanic Mexican gang that's infiltrated our city. It's pretty bad, so we're going to say an MS-13 gang member for the place of the tax man. So, would you rather be a Pharisee? He was very accomplished. People liked him. He had status in society. When he walked into a room, they all looked at him and greeted him, shook his hand. He was part of the ruling class. Everyone wanted to be. And yet you see Jesus waltz this character up to the front of the altar so he can extol all the great things that he is and say, I'm not like those other people. You know, robbers, evildoers, adulterers. I'm not like them. Or like this MS-13 gang. I'm not like that. I'm good. Well, <clears throat> I, I want you to take a look at that MS-13 gang member, but I don't, I don't know if there's any redeeming qualities there. So let's slip back into Judas for a second. Judas is somebody I think that we can identify with. Not because you've necessarily ever betrayed your Lord, but because his sin maybe seems awful right now, and yet was it really so bad? What was it that Judas received in exchange for giving Jesus over? And let's just think this through. Jesus is the perfect son of God, and every time he's gotten into any jam, including a crowd where they wanted to throw him off, he walks right through them. Jesus can get out of anything. You talk about Houdini, nothing stuck to this guy. No. So, if they offer you 30 silver coins, you're going... Uh, yeah, I don't deal in antiquities. So you break it down into day's wages, and you're at about $10,000. 2018 months. Not such a bad deal. And you think there's going to be no harm in it at all. And just think of the poor you could feed with $10,000. And they are after to get him all the time anyway. Is there really any harm? in betraying Jesus. Maybe I'm even being a good steward of my time, right? Pretty soon this sin sounds like such a great deal. How would anybody in their right mind say, no, Jesus wants me to betray him? That's how sin kind of creeps in. I don't know that you walk into a room and say, I am so good I would never sin. I'm above that all the time. It's this seductive, you know what? God wants me to be happy. I've been working really hard. Was anybody going to get hurt by this? Come on. No. And yet, what are the consequences of sin? The first offense, the first offense of your sin is against your God. And then it spills over into the, all the people around you. Even the sins that you think you can just <coughs> keep inside yourself. You know, sure, I'll destroy my own heart. It's not that simple. The witness that you give, the example that you set, people follow that. And pretty soon that sin touches other people's lives, and you're left in a horrible state. And I wonder some days if those tax collectors thought the same thing. I'm going to be a good tax collector. Not like those bad ones. I'm only going to take what I have to. And then a little bit of greed sneaks in, and pretty soon they got a Roman guard at their side, the sword laid at the throat of the person who won't pay off. I don't know, but I do know that it is seductive for us to consider our sin and to not get sucked into it. And what happens is this vicious struggle leaves us hopeless. Ash Wednesday is okay to a point, but if you leave here thinking that you're ashes and that's as far as it goes, I've failed. And you've just walked out of here in despair. Judas's sin was not any worse than Peter's or frankly any others. The reason why Judas took his own life is because he did not seek forgiveness. And the most important part of this parable is the end of verse 13. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, 
God have mercy on me, a sinner. Yes, even for the satanic game member who's murdered a score of people, God can forgive that too. He might spend the rest of his life in jail. There's consequences for sin. Yet they won't be lost. Not forever. No sin is so great that our God can't forgive. And so now I ask you, what did you walk in the door with tonight? What sin did you smear on your forehead that you sit before God and you wonder if they'll ever find out? He already knows. And so you can say with that tax collector, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Because you can find forgiveness. You don't need to say it out loud. You can hear your heart. Verse 14, I tell you that this man, the sinner, the gang member, Judas, rather than the other, went home justified before God. Of course, Judas did not. He He despised and despaired. God's forgiveness. That's not a good place to be. Believe by the power of the Spirit that your sins are forgiven. That your God loves you. That you walk out of here like that phoenix that lives again anew from the ashes. And that you begin this journey with your God during the season of Lent. Hopefully. My kids ask me in the car, why are there some kids who are giving up something for Lent? And I said, well, you give up ice cream? Well, video games. And Richard said, how long? <laughs> and I said, well, it's 40 days. It's, you, you can count them every year. Ash Wednesday, your Good Friday, and then, yeah, it's 40 days. He's like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> 40 days, that's a, that's a long time. Emmy, could you do it? No ice cream? We give things up to refocus ourselves, not on ashes, but on the love that our God had for us by going to the cross. And that's okay. Fasting and other outward symbols can serve a purpose. We say in the catechism. But what God wants to see is a contrite heart. And if giving up ice cream or video games helps you get there, that's fine. You don't have to. God has not commanded that. So you just set aside in your heart what you will do to focus on your God and spend these 40 days focusing on God's love for you. Because you, tonight, go home justified before God. Amen. Please stand. We praise our God for the song, Great